speaker, as I stand to contribute to the 2016 budget debate, I want to acknowledge the effort by the Minister of Finance and his team from the Ministry of Finance for presenting to this House the 2016 budget. Mr. Speaker, the budget document on page 18, paragraph 10, and I wish to quote, substantial financial provision has been made to promote the preservation of indigenous culture, identity, social integration, economic prosperity, physical infrastructure, green energy, sustainable development, and the protection of indigenous lands. Mr. Speaker, these broad categories outlined in the 2016 budget speech simply reward the People's Progressive Party civic legacy of success in the areas of land rights for Amerindians, the economic transformation of the village economies, the challenging issues, social issues faced by hinterland and Amerindian residents, the successes in the expanding of physical and productive infrastructure in the villages, and a successful cultural environment with expanding and increasing recognition of the rich, diverse, and culture of the indigenous people. Mr. Speaker, I took some time to examine the budget to see what financial resources were available to the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs, and I discovered that for the current budget, $776,533,000 were allocated. Then I looked at the capital budget. The capital budget, Mr. Speaker, is what offers direct intervention and affects directly people's lives. And I noted that for the capital expenditure, a mere $1 billion, $407 million were allocated. Mr. Speaker, what this amounts to? This amounts to a mere 0.05% of a budget of $230 billion. It is a shame, Mr. Speaker. It is a shame because the budget speech also recognized, and in the, the words that I want to put it, it boasted of the hinterland being home to our indigenous people, spread, spread across the three quarters of our national landmass, and recognizing the in, in, inequity that exists, yet the budget allocates the least to the most challenged segment of our population. Mr. Speaker, this is unfair. It is unfair to the extent that the capital budget merely offers support to three areas that will actually have some impact on the lives of indigenous people. And I want to deal with these three areas of impact. One start, I would like to say that the first one, just close to $1 billion is going to be spent on a youth project. Mr. Pro Mr. Speaker, this project is a replacement project to what obtained in before May 10th, 2015, a project which supported young indigenous youths, a project 
under the name of the Youth Entrepreneurial and Apprenticeship Project, which engage 1,972 young Amerindians. The engagement of these youths, Mr. Speaker, was engaged, <coughs> was engaged in activities that provided support to community development while attaining experience in various fields like education, health, village administration, regional administration, and to a lesser extent, to engagement with the sectors of forestry, mining, and of course, the maintenance of village assets. Mr. Speaker, it is appalling to know that as soon as the coalition government obtained or got into office, and of course, under questionable circumstances, they dismantled, they dismantled this innovative project geared to support indigenous youths. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I would like to quote, I would like to quote from a statement laid in this house by the Vice President and Minister of Indigenous Peoples Affairs, the Honorable Sidney Alicott. And I quote on page two. Towards this end, with effect from September 1st, YAEP, that's the Youth Apprenticeship and Entrepreneurial Project, will be replaced by the Hinterland Employment and Youth Services. And all former CSOs will be eligible to be en enlisted for training to receive relevant skills so as to enable them to earn an income in the pursuit of sustainable livelihood. And as a means to enjoying the good life the good life. Under the new initiative, we hope to train thousands of young people while paying them a stipend. Mr. Speaker, this project, which was declared to be implemented on September 1st, 2015, has resulted not in Amerindian youths enjoying a good life. It has resulted in Amerindian youths being lesser in terms of what they obtain. They lost interest in community development. They are no longer meaningfully engaged at the community level. And if one was to calculate from May to f January of this year, the loss of income, and I'm only calculating the loss of income from May to January of this year, they have lost dollars I'm speaking, I, I'm speaking of May to January. And for the information, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, and for the information of this house, a supplemental was brought to this house to pay the CSO, which we supported. Mr. Speaker, I wish to say, the loss of meaningful engagement of the youths from Region 1, 7, 8, and 9 did not only affect directly 
1,972 individuals, but it affected approximately 12,000 family members. It also contributed to the collapse of the very growing entrepreneurial spirit in those villages. It caused the, it caused the collapse, Mr. Speaker, to businesses in those villages because annually that project contributed almost $1 billion circulating in indigenous communities across the hinterland. Mr. Speaker, as I listen to the Honorable, Mr. Speaker, as I listen to the Honorable Junior Minister on Tuesday, when the Honorable Member was presenting her presentation on the budget, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Junior Minister of Amerindian Affairs noted that these 1,972 young people were not genuine youths. She said that they were PPP politicians. This is a grave insult. This is a grave insult to young Amerindian youths. Mr. Speaker, why? Why is it a grave insult to Amerindian youths? Because her comment infringed on the rights of indigenous youths to make a choice, a political, free political choice, just in the event that indeed there were PPP politicians. Secondly, Secondly, disbanding the YEP project and the slot with which they have moved not to replace it is also infringing on the economic rights and opportunities of young indigenous people. Young indigenous people. Mr. Speaker, this is a classic example of payback time for the Amerindian electorate. Because in the May 11th election 2015, the Amerindians voted overwhelmingly for the People's Progressive Party civic government. And to pay them back with the denial of engagement in their community and taking away their income does not allow them to enjoy the good life. In fact, it is a discrimination. It is a discrimination not to support young Amerindians when they are engaged meaningfully in activities that could enhance their skills and capacities. Mr. Speaker, it is discrimination against the indigenous youths to deny them income for service to their community. It is discrimination and discriminatory to punish young Amerindians and their families on the assumption that they are politically aligned. This goes against all international norms and law as it relates to indigenous people. criminal infringement. It's a criminal infringement. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, I want to say it is a criminal and an infringement of indigenous people's economic rights. I want to underscore that. I wish to underscore it. And I will wish that the Minister of Indigenous Affairs will tell this House today when he speaks. Why is it from September 1 to January 31st, he has not been able to roll out the HEYS project to benefit Amerindians. What is keeping him back? He is in his seat. He has great power and authority to stand up and represent.
represent his people. He, the authority is in his hands. It is in his hands to ensure that as a minister with portfolio responsible for assisting young people, and in fact, I'm reminded, vice president in this nation, then he must track, he must be able to monitor, and he must be able to ensure that his portfolio and the responsibility matches the salary that he takes home. <laughs> billion dollars from indigenous community matches the increase that the coalition government provided increased salaries for themselves. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, again, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the budget also spoke about support for indigenous education. And they afforded, they afforded the words, and it's recorded in the budget speech, that in this year, they will provide monies to design a facility to support young indigenous people, young indigenous youths, well, youths, indigenous youths, to access higher learning. Mr. Speaker, nothing is wrong with that, Mr. Speaker, but I want to ensure that the indigenous people and the nation understand that this project is also one which is coming late. It is late because in 2015, just before the prorogation of this parliament, the cabinet approved for the design and the construction of this, in this facility to assist indigenous youth with cheap, adequate, and affordable accommodation. Mr. Speaker, budget 2015 came. The government brought budget 2015, and they boast of two budgets in less than a year. But in the first budget, they failed to include that very critical project to support youth, indigenous youth development. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in the 2016 budget, I wish for the minister to explain to this house why is it that he sat back and allowed only an allocation for the design of the building. One year to design a building, a facility? Is that how you measure your performance? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, when we built the Lillian, the Lillian Dahl student dorm, we, de we dealt with design and construction in a single year. Mr. Speaker, delaying the construction of this critical facility will only delay the opportunities of young indigenous people to access higher learning opportunities. Parents of current students, parents of current students who are going to the university and other technical institutions in Georgetown are always concerned. And I was told that on some trips into the interior, these matters were raised. And I want to ask the minister what propelled him to finally bring this project in 2016? And what did he not see right in bringing also or asking the Ministry of Finance to provide funding for construction? Answer that. The delay that you continue to have in your ministry is not impacting positively on the well-being for a good life for indigenous people. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Mr. Speaker. Scholarship support. Mr. Speaker, scholarship support. The budget also make mention of how <coughs> this government, the coalition government, is going to support 450 scholarship students. I want to remind this house and the nation that this project was established in the early, in the late and early 60s by the People's Progressive Party. And, and I am happy that this program still continues on to today providing support to indigenous students. But what I'm not happy about, Mr. Speaker, is the fact that parents have been asking last year, because they told me so, they have made representation, and I'm representing them here in this parliament, for an increase for the students' stipends. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, they need an increase. And since the government, when they got into office, disbanded the We Care project and denied 10,000 each for children per year, it also affected indigenous students who are on regional and national scholarship. And I am asking the minister to seek an audience with the minister of finance and ask the Minister of Finance whether it is not too late to increase the $4,000 to $10,000 per year, per month. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, why should indigenous people always have to be, <clears throat> always have to be fighting and challenging the comrades and ministers and honorable leaders on the, op on the opposite side. Mr. Speaker, this, has be this had been the trend of what occurred when the PNC was there. Yeah, and it is now creeping in again when they have to beg, when they have to come and ask, and when the vision which the other side promised them that we're very visionary. We'll make your life easy. There's a good life ahead of you. Vote for us. Mr. Speaker, you need to get up and act on behalf of your people. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> school uniforms for children. This is another support which the government, the PPP civic government, when, was in, when they were in office, afforded the in hinterland students. And later on, it became a national support. Mr. Speaker, school uniform has just arrived a couple of weeks ago in Region 9. Region 9, not from September, it should have been bought in July or it should have been bought before September and distributed by December because the budget came late. I agree. But now, in February, Region 1, 7, and 8 are still awaiting. It is two academic terms that children have not yet received benefits from your government from your government. Mr. Speaker, I was told yesterday, or a comment was made yesterday during a presentation, that we have the same CSO and we have the same everybody. Well, make them work the way they used to work before. But I understand that now they don't listen to technical people anymore. They don't listen to those who work on the field. And the barrage of highly I don't, it's not even qualified, of highly acclaimed, unqualified experts they have around them are now misleading them. They have legal advisor, they have advisor on sports and culture, 
They have advisor on every single thing, and yet they cannot deal with the job. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I now want to turn to land titling. Honorable Member, you have five minutes remaining. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, land I'd like to, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to be able to ask for the extension of the Honorable Member's time to include the five minutes to bring it to a total of 35 minutes. Thank you, sir. Mr. Speaker, land titling. I thank the Honorable Mr. Member. Honorable Member, you will speak for 35 minutes, a total of 35 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, land titling. Since, they were, since the coalition government and their politicians were in the opposition, they continued to mumble and they continued to champion, as they say, land rights for Amerindians. And even in the budget, it says monies are in the budget and they will deal with land protection for indigenous people. Mr. Speaker, I want to let this house know that the People's Progressive Party civic government, between the years of 2012 and 2013, secured funding, secured funding, adequate funding to deal with this matter. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Vice President Sidney Alicott sat on the MSSC and he had every single detail and information related to this matter and what obtains since he got in, since they're so, they're so efficient more than the PPP civic government. I'll tell you what happened. To date, they have not yet titled any single village since they've been there. They have not dealt with the extension applications that were applied for by indigenous people. They have not produced any new demarcation for Amerindian lands. This is eight months into their term. Nine months. And I saw yesterday, I saw yesterday a manifesto of the coalition government. And in that, that manifesto, they have like seven paragraphs expounding international norms and rights about land and protecting Amerindians. And today, they have not yet done anything as it relates to land. And let me tell you, I want to look, I'll, I'll read it to you. Mr. Speaker, I call on the minister to prioritize projects that will bring greater benefit to Amerindians. Yeah, bring greater benefits to Amerindians. And desist from sitting long hours and months dealing with systems. Approve, approve the title for Kangaruma. Approve the title for Tasserine. Approve the title for Sawariwo. Approve the title for Eclipse Falls. And approve the title for Parbara. Mr. Speaker, I ask the minister to do these things in the one year that he has. Because it seems as though he has, he and his company, sorry, the Honorable Minister and his company has abandoned the ALT and the partnership we have with the UNDP on these matters. They have totally abandoned ship. Mr. Speaker, I also wish to ask the minister if, if, it is not too complicated for him that he must cooperate with GGMC to deal with the fact that <coughs> Kangaroo and Tasserine mining claims approved after 2013 in these areas let him sit and negotiate it because the indigenous people and in the report noted, noted that these matters were critical and key to their ownership. Mr. Speaker, 
the title of Kangaroo and Tassereen should be provided to them this year. The investigation is over, the review was done, and there's nothing keeping them back with the exception of claims that were approved after 2013. In fact, I will tell this House, let me tell this House, in 2012, titles were prepared for those communities. Titles were prepared for those communities. And the wickedness that occurred in the mining sector disallowed Tassarine and Kamarua from owning land now. And I call upon you, you're sitting there. Do not allow this title issue, do not allow this to go unanswered. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I call on the government also to provide titles to Rockstone. The matter of Rockstone has had extensive discussion. So much so that so many compromises were made. Finally, the Amerindians, who are not greedy people, have agreed that within a one square mile on the main road that anyone with legal and formal leases to their lands will be excised out. The Amerindian Act allows for that. And yet, and yet you are delaying the Rockstone title. Give the lands to the Amerindians. You are there uh, quite a lot. Mr. Speaker, work was done on extension application, and I want to expend my time talking about extension. Please give Mainstay, Mashabo, Bethany, Kapui, Wakapau, Akwini, St. Monica, and Sand Creek, Patarano, Makamaka, their extension. Investigation reports are on your desk. Investigation reports are on your desk. Honorable member. And you are entrusted in ensuring that they get their lands. Honorable member, you have four minutes remaining. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> they talk about I, I will go off land because these matters are public and it is important for the nation to, to, to know. But I want to say that the Amerindian Development Fund, which also our, the PPP civic government secured more than 6.4 million US to generate economic activities, to stimulate village economy, and to transform the way of production in those villages. Mr. Speaker, up to now, not a single cent was spent since they assumed office from this money. Mr. Speaker, I can read in last year, the first quarter, how many villages accessed funds from the ADF for the micro project. Mr. Speaker, today, as we stand, the only thing that the Ministry of Indigenous Affairs was able to, to accomplish, <coughs> and I can read, Mr. Mr. the only thing that they were able to accomplish was two things, two things. A meeting with the North Rupununi Board, Development Board, to control the funding for 16 Amerindian communities in that location that comes from ADF. They don't want the community you have, you to have two minutes remaining on simply member. by themselves. On they remember, want, you have two minutes remaining. Mr. Speaker, they want the North Rupununi Development Board to be the implementer of these projects for these 16 communities. Every time you hear anyone talk about the interior from the coalition, you hear about Anai Surama, North Rupununi Board, and Bina Hill. The indigenous community is expansive. It's go beyond that area. It goes into Region 7, Region 9, other parts in Region 9, Region 1. We have to start focusing on the bigger things for everyone, not only for one selected area, because Sydney comes from there. 
The Honorable Vice President comes from there. Mr. Speaker, we, they have to stop focusing on the small things like the bees. On the bees, there has been no new initiative to complement these big ticket projects left by the party. Bicycles. I don't remember. Some expandable slippers and boots. I don't remember your time is up. The next 